Bibles, if you will, and turn with me over to 2 Kings chapter 7. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 7, and I also wanted to mention, you can pray for my mother-in-law. She's uh, again back in the ER room, and she should be probably coming out here. This struggle with uh, allergies, I guess. I can't quite figure it out. Uh, but anyway, pray for her. But 2 Kings chapter 7, I don't know if you've ever heard a message preached on uh, this passage before, but uh, uh, to tell you the truth, I've heard several passages, several preachers preach on this, this message. And so, uh, but I want us to come at it with a, a fresh perspective and knowing that no matter what, how many times you've heard it, God can always speak to our hearts. And uh, as I've been working on here this morning, you can probably tell I had that uh, uh, that little mirror that I had sent out in front. And, and I, I want this to be a, a, a object lesson for us that we just as I preached on this morning, that it's not looking in the mirror that's going to change us, it's looking in God's mirror of the Bible. And sometimes these object lessons help bring things to a, uh, uh, it brings clarity to what we're trying to get across, or at least what I'm trying to get across in the message that I preach unto you. And uh, we need to use our time effectively, and so henceforth I, I got a, 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 a clock out front. And as I mentioned to Brother Dwight this morning, or tonight, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, now that you can see what time it is, and you'll be keeping track of everything that I'll be saying. But uh, here you'll see directly as we look at the four lepers. And they got a decision to make. They can either stay where they are in a condition to be none the better. They can go into the city where people are dying, and they can determine whether that's a good decision or not, or they have another uh, choice to make whether to go and face the Syrians who are besieging the city. So let's look at this, verses 1 all the way down to verse 11. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1 through 11. It says, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, that tomorrow about this time shall the measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. And then the Lord, on whose hand that the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. He, he pronounces a judgment because the servant upon whom the king is leaning upon doubts the word of God. And, and, and Elisha tells him, he says, you know, Since you doubt it, this is going to be a judgment against you. It says, you'll behold with your eyes, but you shall not eat. Verse 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. The situation is turned from the city, what's going on there, now to the, the situation outside of the gates where the lepers are. Now there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city. And we should die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. And now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. You know, or we'll die either way if they take our lives. In verse 5, And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there, and for, for the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of the chariots, a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians that come upon us. And wherefore they arose and they fled in the twilight. And they left their tents and their horses and their asses and the, even the camp as it was, and they fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the innermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink, and they carried then silver and gold and raiment, and they went and hid it, and they came again, and they entered into another tent, and they carried thence also. And they went and hid it, and then uh, they said one to another, We do not well this day. Uh, we do not well. This day is the day of good tidings. And we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, 
some mischief will come upon us. And now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. And so they came, and they called unto the porter of the city, and they told him, saying, We come to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and tents as they were. And they called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. And the king rose in the night, and he said to the servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us, and they will know that we be hungry, and therefore are they going out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. Man, their doubt knows no bounds. It seems like even though that they had the glad tidings of this message that uh, the Syrians are fled, they, they've gone back to their own town, that these lepers come in, and they, they, they don't have anything to gain by telling the king of Israel, hey, the, the Syrians have a great and plenteous provision. God has supplied our needs. We don't have to suffer here anymore. We don't have to go through this time of famine. We don't have to face this time of doubt in our lives. We don't have to be in distress. We don't have to be depressed. We don't have to be discouraged. God has given a great abundance despite their spiritual depravity. And this isn't a blessing, but all the while the king still doubts, though he has the man of God's word. He still doubts, though he knows God's goodness time and time and time again there upon his life. It's probably the same king that we find is going through a wilderness. And as I've mentioned before, he's, you know, as he tries to go in and recover all the goods from the king of Moab, he sees Elisha do a great and mighty work and the waters poured out. It's the same king that, uh, you know, just in the chapter previous, when Naaman comes and he's cleansed, and, uh, you know, he goes back home, and then the next thing you know, the Syrians are coming out and they're chasing and pursuing after because Elijah keeps telling him where the Syrians are camped out against the king of Israel. They're in Samaria. And you remember as Elijah pronounces blindness upon the Syrians and leads them into the city and brings peace upon them where there should have been destruction, he sees Elijah time and time and time again, the man of God has nothing but peace toward the king of Israel. There should be no reason why he should doubt God's word. You see what I'm saying? Now we're at a time where there's a great crisis upon their hands. The time is running out. They got a decision to make. Many times when a preacher is preaching upon this passage, they focus upon the, the four leprous men. But I want you to see that there's a not just the, the four leprous men who are on their way. I mean, they're dying. That's true. But there's a city that's dying as well. And the time, the clock, is running out. If God doesn't do something, the people within inside that city is going to die. If the four leprous men don't do anything about their situation, they're going to die. So it matters what we do with our time. Every one of us spends time in a different way, in different form, different fashion. Some people are wasting time. And they spend it all on their flesh, all upon what they want, and all upon what they desire. And, and the thought of God is far from their mind and far from their imagination, and they're none the better. What matters in our life, as you've heard it repeated time and time and time again, is that little dash that one day is going to be on our tombstone. What did you do with your time? We could all talk about the tragic situations that we're up against. But well, let's talk about the work that needs to be done in the time that's been given unto us. Jesus says in John chapter 9, verse 4, you remember the, the man who was born blind, and the disciples walked on by and said, Who, who did sin, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, No man sinned, and neither this man nor his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in his life. And, you remember there in the, uh, verse 4, he says this, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And folks, can I tell you, the time is running out for each and every one of us. Uh, as you mentioned, 43 years old, that's a short life in comparison. I'm only uh, three or four years away from that. 
We don't know how much time that we have left. And all we want to sit and we want to squander our time or we want to do nothing with what God has been given unto us. Or are we going to go out by faith? Show the works by our faith. Show our faith by our works is what I meant to say. Because faith without works is dead. Second Kings chapter 7, again, there's a darkness that settles over top of Israel and their situation. There's a time of a great conflict that's going on. And as a result of their departure from the Lord, they're spiritually uh, gone away. They're not serving in God. They're not looking for God. They're not turning to God. They're, they're not believing God at this point. There's a great disbelief that's brought over them. And now the year is 892 B.C. Israel was at war with the northern tribe of Syria. And maybe, I don't know what it is, I don't know if maybe uh, the king of Israel thought that, well, Elisha, if he had not let the Syrians go, when they got this great blindness over top of them, and they blinded them and brought them into Samaria, if we would have had not let them go, maybe we wouldn't be in this predicament. I don't know if maybe he was thinking that. But now the Syrians are encamped about him, and it seems like, uh, you know, I, as I've told you before, we used to have this babysitter who had this snake, and it would practice coils around that mouse, all to squeeze and to choke them out. And really, this is what I see going on here in this city. He's besieged it round the mouse, and nobody's coming in, nobody's getting out. He choked out all the supplies, so much so that uh, they, they have no provisions. It's a desperate situation. If you were wealthy, you might uh, have a chance to, uh, their delicacy would have been that donkey's head. You know that? To me, that's not much of a meal. We're spending a week's wages, uh, you know, the most, the, the richest of them are spending a week's wages just to get ahead of a donkey to eat, to survive on for that day. The poorest of them are surviving off the dung of a, do a dove, and uh, that's not much of a meal either. I can't believe people would eat something like that. That's how low the conditions of God and all of it because Israel has turned away from God and, and, and God says that this is what's going to happen when you forsake the Lord. And how many times does He have to prove this? You can see it all written throughout the law. Those who forsake God are also going to have to take the curse of the law. They've turned from God. gotten so low that the, now the women are eating their own children. Look at it verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 27. We'll look, let's look at verse 26. Let's back up one verse. It says, As the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? If the lord doesn't help thee, how shall I help thee? You see that? out of the barn floor, out of the wine press. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered and said, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. And so he boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she had hid her son. It's a, some of the things that, I mean, the, God doesn't hide any of this wickedness. And some of the things you read in the Bible seem so deplorable. You say, how in the world can this be? When you think back in the book of Judges, when every man's doing what's right in his own eyes, and even the old Levitical priest who should have been showing the way of the Lord had now gone astray, and, and, and the one who has his concubine has been abused and cut into 12 pieces. And we see tragedies like that happening left and right nation of Israel has sunk very, very low. Now they're starving to death. And they had like a stranglehold upon them. The king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, he led his troops to surround Samaria. No one was coming in. Nobody was getting out. Weeks turned into months. Food was running out. The people were starving to death. And uh, uh, we see nothing but this uh, unthinkable destitution upon uh, this place and even upon the world that you and I live in. 
Amid this uh, bleak situation, the prophet came on the scene. He, he offers this message of hope. And so far as we can tell, you know, they, they thought to themselves, Elisha must be crazy. Isn't it amazing after the king of Israel comes and he's face to face with what? Their spiritual wickedness they've gotten. And he thinks this is atrocious. That they're going to eat their own babies. He rends his clothes. He cries out. He says, this is an unthinkable tragedy. Instead of amending his ways, you know what he does? He goes and seeks the, the, the prophet's head. That's what he does. He says, this is Elisha's fault. And so he goes into the house. He goes up to Elisha and pursues after him. And he goes up to Elisha. And what does Elisha have to say? It's amazing to me. You would think that he would pronounce a judgment against him. But instead of a judgment, he pronounces hope. Look at it. Verse 1 of our text. And Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall the measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel. Fine flour would be something that they would use in the best bakeries of the world, I would suppose. You know, it's, it's good flour. It's not something that's, uh, you know, no, it's, a, it's a big hands up compared to the dung of the dove, right? You know, which, which one would you rather have? Obviously, the fine flour. About this time tomorrow, we shall, uh, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. People want to start opening up shops and instead of selling all these atrocious things, they're going to be selling flour. And they're going to be selling barley cakes. Verse 2, Then the Lord on whose hand... Uh, King Lane answered and said to the man of God, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? How can you doubt the hand of God that this man does? This was an announcement beyond belief. And the king's servant, he asked the question, Behold, if the Lord make windows in heaven, might the same be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. And what we see here is an unthinkable hardship. We see a besieged city. We see a hard famine. We see a people eating their babies. We see a people literally starving themselves to death. Their ribs are showing the, 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 the situation that they're in is unthinkable. And here, Elisha says the, the, the unimaginable, the unbelievable, the, the, the unsearchable riches of God. I mean, he, he shares with them a message of hope. Elisha, how is this going to happen? You would probably have the same sort of question. Elijah, are you crazy to think that God is going to open up the windows of heaven and, and provide all these things? You think it's going to drop down as in a day? Keep in mind, he says, tomorrow this is going to happen. Not, not, not a year from now, not a week from now, not a month from now. Tomorrow about this time. And anything short of divine intervention, it's not going to happen. Man cannot make this happen on his own. I know sometimes situations can be tough. I know circumstances can be hard. I know hardships can come before anybody. And sometimes it comes to the place where all we can do is look up. Faith believes in the possibility of a better tomorrow. More than that, faith believes in a God who can God always uses faith. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. And they that come to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And uh, so we must exercise faith in order to please God. And when we exercise that faith and obedience and apply the work and do exactly what God has called us to do, we, we can only imagine what God can do in your heart and in your life. And here's another passage for you to think about. 
they use the name of the Lord over and over and over again. Even the king says, you know, I'm not the Lord. I can't make these things happen for you. I can't help you. If the Lord doesn't help you, how can I help you? But it says this in 2 Chronicles, a well familiar passage, 714, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face, and pray I'll hear from heaven and heal their land. Isn't that what it says? It starts with turning from their wicked ways. The city is in a tragic situation, but now we see that there's four men on the way to the prophecy of Elijah. They weren't there when Elijah spoke these words. They weren't there when Elisha gave the word of God. They didn't hear what God was going to do. They just knew that they were in a desperate situation in themselves. And the situation that they were faced with was an emblematic or a symbolic of everything that they were doing there within the city. Their leprosy was like the sin that the sin that was upon the light there in Samaria. Just as the four leprous men were dying, the city was dying. Just like the four men had the decision to make, what are we going to do? The people in the city of Samaria has a decision to make, what am I going to do? The only difference is, is the four, leper, uh, four leprous men, they said that we have, we're going to do something, and the men in the city says, we're not going to do anything at all. But we see these four dying men, diseased, displaced, living in the most dismal situation imaginable. These men occupied no man's land of hopelessness and rejection, and yet they, they had a, a good line of thinking. The lepers weren't permitted to enter into the city. They were afraid to travel very far outside of the city. They were stuck between a rock and a hard place. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. The options were bleak. Time was not on their side. Eventually, the leprosy would take their life. If they stayed there, there was no hope. If they stayed there, the only thing that they could look forward to was death. If they stayed there, they couldn't help themselves. There was no position. If they stayed there, nobody in the city could come to their help. If they stayed there, they might have a chance to get stuck up in the battle between the Syrians and the Israelis and lose their life. If they stayed there, it wasn't good. could have asked the question, why doesn't somebody do something? But instead of looking everywhere else for somebody else to do something for them, they reflected upon their own situation. And death had a way of moving their hearts to want to do something. We must take the gospel to the world. Faith without works is dead. So, decision to make. Now notice the decision in verses 3 and 4. He says, Why sit we here until we die? And if we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we should die there. And if we sit here, we'll die also. If we sit here, we don't have anything to look forward to death. If we go into the city, they're worse off than we are. We can't go into the city. They're dying in there. They don't have anything to eat. What are they going to give us? Not only are we outcasts, not only will they not receive us, but they don't have anything to offer in the first place. We wouldn't be better off going there. So what are we going to do? We want to throw our hands at the mercies of the Syrians. We want to throw our hands at the mercy of God. Outside of the walls is a world that isn't much better than Samaria. You know, I don't know what you see outside the walls. It's sad that uh, we face so much, and I know you hear time and time and time again about this sort of preach, but it's still true. It's, it's terrible, the, the, the abominations that go on in this land. It's terrible, the situations of the abortions that take place time and time again. It's a terrible situation when you think about, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but it's true. When I look at the news and I see that there's a drone strike that kills 10 people who are allies, not enemies, 
And they said, oops, we made a mistake, as if that's not a life. It's a terrible situation that we've come to when, when nobody's concerned about the souls anymore and what's taking place within the hearts and lives of the desperate situations that we find ourselves in. And it seems to be we, we're more concerned about ourselves and, and, and what we're faced with and what's going on in the world. And souls become of little importance. You've got to be careful because we're not much better than they. And again, confusion's on every hand and it's a sick world that's out there and who's going to reach them? To sit here is to do nothing and to wait on death. It's only a matter of time. You know, I talked about my grandmother's farm. And there, you remember when I, my grandmother's farm, we were there on Strawberry Hill Farm outside of uh, uh, Edinburgh, Virginia. I, I always tell people I'm from Woodstock because probably the backside of Edinburgh, nobody would probably recognize toward Columbia Furnace, as I've told you about. And uh, there on Strawberry Hill Farm, you know, we, we've had just all kinds of vehicles sitting alongside of the farm. And any time one breaks down, there's another one added to the side of the lane. And, and in the field, we had three tractors that are doing nothing but sitting there. Uh, up on the other side of the hills, and we have all, nothing but dilapidated buildings. Inside the dilapidated buildings that we have, the barn and all the, 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 the corn shacks and shelters and things of that nature, and the, and the little the coverings that we have over top of the farm equipment that hasn't moved probably most of my life being there. You look around and you can see that, uh, that since nobody has cleared any of the, the, the grass that's there, instead of it being hay, it's nothing but weeds that's overtaken the land that's there. And when we talk about why should we here, we can picture that going on within our hearts and minds. Because we can slip back and I, I can tell you time and time and time again, we go down to the bottom of the hill and I'd watch those vehicles and those tires begin to rot. Why? Because they sat there too long. Look over the tractors and you look at the cars, the Ford Maverick and, and the, the, the Scout International and some of the other vehicles that some people even desire today to have, set down to the bottom of the farm and all they did was rust through, just like the, uh, the Chevy Silverado that we had. All these vehicles are doing nothing but rusting and the tires are rotting and you would go up into the buildings and the buildings are falling down all around you. You can look at the grass and there's nothing but weeds. That's what happens when you just let it sit there and nothing's going on. It just decays. And it falls apart. And nothing's the better, nothing's increased. And that's what happens when, when we don't fulfill the Great Commission and go out and reach a lost and dying world. We just sit here. You hear the Word of God and do nothing. We've got to be careful about that sort of mentality. And that's why I encourage you to pass out the revival flyers. That's why I encourage you to pass out the tracts. Why? Because of the message of hope that we have. It's an encouragement. That's what happens when we don't do anything. It falls apart. This was a realization of death that woke them up out of their apathy. Shook them from their indifference. And the only time that you can claim inability is if we're in a grave. A lot of people are good for claiming inability. Well, I can't. I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I can't do the other. Ecclesiastes 9 4, for it's uh, to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope, and for a living dog is better than the dead lion. It wasn't just a decision of the lepers, it was a picture of a dying city. But these lepers did something about their situation. Instead of waiting for the next day, they said, We're going to go with the light that we have. It's twilight, it's not quite dark yet, but it's getting dark, it's there into the evening. They weren't going to wait till the very next morning. They weren't going to light a fire and stay till the next day. They said, We're going now. 
as the light fades into the night and they're going out and they're marching into the city, they, they put their faith into the works and they're going out and they're heading toward the Syrians and they're seeking any hope that they can and they're searching and they're looking and they, they, they are buying up their time, they're redeeming the time. Jonah went in and he preached to the Ninevites against his will. God woke him up, cast him out of the great fish. He goes and he preaches into that great city. The ones who don't know their left hand from their right hand. They don't know good from evil. And understanding who God is and that he's gracious and merciful and loving. God didn't send him in there because he, uh, he, he just knew that he, he wanted that city to repent and get right. And Jonah goes in and he preaches that message and they repent and they say this. Who, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from this fierce anger that we perish not? And that was their motive. Who can tell if we go into the hands of the Syrians whether God will save us? Who can tell if we go into the Syrians whether God will provide for us? Who can tell if we go to the Samarians that God will suffice for us and meet our every need? There's a lot of people that talk about their faith. And it's easy to talk about faith. It's hard to go. hard to go and face the future not knowing what's going to happen on the other end. It's hard to go out and not knowing what you're getting yourself into. But these men trusted in the mercy of God. Notice in, uh, again, verse 5, they go out of twilight, they move in the light that's been given unto them, they redeem the time. And these poor men, they, they go out and they head out into the fields now. It's, it's amazing to me that just as they are going out, the same time that they leave out, the very same time that they act in faith, is the very same time that God sends, does something amazing here, and uh, I'll try to find it here, in verse 6. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of the chariots, the noise of the horses, and the noise of a great host. And they sent one to another, lo, the king of Israel had hired us. Now they cut off all the ways. All the past, but yet they say, perhaps maybe the king of Israel had hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. And when did this happen? At twilight. Verse 7, Wherefore they arose and they fled in the twilight and they left their tents. At the very same time that lepers acted is the very same time that uh, the Syrian army picks up, they hear the noise and they say, we got to get out of here. We're in a great big trouble. It was God who sent the noise. God saw their faith. God saw their obedience. And that's all God wants us to do. Nobody sees it. Nobody may not recognize what you're doing, how often did you go, how, how often you share, how many times you gave the gospel message to somebody that you've been reaching for years and years and years and nobody may know about it. God sees it. God can reach anybody. But it takes faith to go. But it takes foolishness to stay. I want to move on because uh, as they come into this camp here, they they see the campfires and everything else, but nobody's there to meet them. And they go in, and, and as they see all the provisions that's been left behind, they're amazed themselves. And as they begin to eat and to drink and to partake of all the goods that are round about, I mean, their souls are reviving. Now they are refreshed by everything that they have, and, and, and they are rejoicing, and they begin to try to hide the things that they have. And, and then their heart begins to prick their conscience, and they say, what we are doing is not good. 
Not only do they have a decision to go or a decision to stay, we can make a decision to stay and not go and we're not going to be any better because of it. Or we can decide to go and be blessed in our deeds. But then also we've got to come to the realize we've got a message to spread. A message to deliver. It's amazing to me. Verse 9 says, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. I can think of another day of great tidings, can't you? When the angels sang out. When the shepherds came to the, from the hills of Bethlehem with all their sheep, and they came into a little manger and worshipped God. When the wise men came and they appeared before Mary and Joseph, this is after he matured in uh, a couple, about a year or two. But there upon the hillside, you remember the angels gave the glorious message and the next thing you know the shepherds appeared and then they go out and proclaim the good news. They said we got glad tidings that we need to be sharing. Again on the hills of Bethlehem it was the good tidings of a Savior who was born in the city of David. And they said we do not well. We do not well when we hold our peace concerning the gospel message. Let me just say this. When Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan, and he told him about how a man was taken by robbers and left on the side of the road for dead. He said that there was a priest that walked on by and he didn't do anything. He didn't come to his aid. He didn't minister unto him. He didn't reach out to him. He didn't see if he was okay. He just looked from a distance. And left him dead. Well, he didn't know if he was dead or alive. There was a Levite that passed on by the same man. He got a little bit closer, but he didn't want to, uh, you know, defile himself or whatever the case may have been. But the Levite got a little bit closer just to look over on the edge there to ditch and saw that man laying dead. Well, it wasn't dead. I don't know why I keep saying that, but it uh, wasn't dead. But he saw him laying there. It didn't help him. Heard him groaning, but it didn't help him. Jesus said, there's another man. He's a Samaritan, and he's going to walk on by the way. And when he saw him, he didn't leave him there along the side of the road. What did he do? He goes and he picks him up, puts him upon the donkey, and rides him into town and brings him to the innkeeper and takes care of him. And he said, what's over this man needs? Charge that to my account. Who did Jesus condemn? Did he condemn the robbers? Or did he condemn the Levites who could have done something and didn't? Condemn the chief priests who could have done something and didn't? We get over to James chapter 4. Wonderful passage of scripture there. And, and James has just come through as he talks about in chapter 2. If somebody comes in to you and they ask for goods and you tell them to go out and be warm and fill, God will take care of you and you don't provide for his needs. Knowing that you can do something about it, but you don't. He says, I'll show you my faith by my works. I'll supply his needs and God will take care of me. He condemns them for the practice when they say, brags about their faith. And he talks about another situation where there comes in a good man amongst them and all you're praising and worshiping the rich man, but yet when the poor man comes into the doors, you push him to the back of the building and don't want anything to do with him. He says, don't you know all of us suffer alike? All of us are under the same time constraints. We, we don't know whether we have tomorrow to live or not. And your hypocrisy and you're showing favor to one against another, that's not good. He condemns them for the speech. He says the tongue is an unruly fire. And if any man can control his tongue, and I'll tell you who, who has a good religion, a man can control his tongue. 
It says in chapter 4, he says, You ask and you ask and miss, and you desire and war, and you want to consume these things upon your own lusts. It's not about you, and it's not about what you want. And then he says, uh, I'm trying to get down to my verse here. I gotta, this is the way my mind works. He tells him, he says, are you going to go out to such and such a city? You're going to buy and sell and get gay, but yet you want to say if the Lord wills. You're acting a lot on the flesh, but you're not acting <coughs> on the faith that you say that you have. And he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. God sent Ezekiel to be a watchman. And he says, if you don't warn the people and tell them, if you don't give them my word, and warn them of the, their sin, if you don't tell them about the judgment that I've pronounced against them, then their blood is upon your hands. Now, if they don't respond, that's, that's their, their problem. Your goal is not how they respond. Your goal is to be obedient. <coughs> These leprous men knew that it wasn't well to hold the message back. They go into the city. They proclaim the message. They reach out unto them. They become the evangelists and they reach the, the city of Samaria. Now granted, they, 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 they don't have a great revival like they do in Nineveh. But they could have. But they see the goodness of God. They see the goodness and severity of God at the same time. Severity in the fact that they were running away from God and God had pronounced a great judgment upon them to where they were starving to death and they were eating their own children and they were going through great suffering. The severity of the Lord, the judgment pronounced against them and the goodness of God on the other hand where He provided for them. But what are you doing with the time? They had every opportunity to turn to God. They had every opportunity to seek God's mercy. What are you doing with the time? Are you sitting here? Or are you doing something about what you heard and what you saw? About what God has done in your life? About the goodness of God? About the greatness of God? What are you doing with your time? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, I always remember the words of Bill Slater. He said that the only way that evil prevails is if a good man does nothing. Lord, I want to be a man of action. And these four men didn't experience any sort of they didn't see the love of God or they didn't see the goodness of God until they went. And they didn't see how God could bless until they went. They didn't know what they were up against. But if they didn't go, nothing was going to change. I I'm convicted by this myself. Because if I personally don't go, nothing's going to change. And I pray you would do a work within our hearts and lives. Help us to redeem the time. Help us to work the works of God while it's still day, while we still have life. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's stand to our feet. We're just going to sing one verse of face to face in number six. In number six. Sing the first verse.